Starting back probably about eight years ago, I would spend eight or nine hours in bed and wake up feeling absolutely like I hadn't closed my eyes. I was so tired, I could not stay awake. It felt like I was losing my mind. In a sense, it affected my sense of identity. I mean, I was no longer the, the competent, you know, focused, um, accomplished woman that I had been for most of my adult life. And that was very, very difficult. My primary care doctor suggested that I might have sleep apnea. She said, you know, I really think you ought to get uh, a sleep study done because if in fact you do have a, a sleep disorder and it's not diagnosed, it could be putting a lot of additional strain on your heart and lungs and you don't need that. And I said, you're right, I don't. Sherry? Yeah. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. You can come with me and I'm gonna take your vitals. After I'd had the study and I had come to find out the results, the first thing they did was take my weight and my height and my blood pressure and my pulse oxygenation. I'm also going to measure your neck circumference because this is a risk factor for people with apnea. After that, I saw the doctor uh, and he did a, a brief physical exam and then he also went over the results of the test. The bottom line is you have some breathing problem about once every three minutes while you're asleep. Your oxygen levels get as low as 85%. With my apnea at that level, could that still be responsible for how tired I'm feeling? Yeah, so certainly mild sleep apnea can still cause lots of symptoms. We know that uh, waking up recurrently can certainly fragment sleep and make people feel crummy the next day. It's also likely to be the case that their performance in different memory tasks and different uh, uh, brain functions, neurocognitive tasks, uh, are impaired by sleep apnea. Every time you stop breathing, you wake up. You stop breathing, you wake up. And in your case, that happens about every three minutes that you're asleep. If I were lying here asleep, you came and shook me every three minutes, I wouldn't sleep so well and, and I'd feel cranky the next day. I might be grouchy and irritable. The other set of issues, though, that we get is every time the airway collapses, the lungs can't do their job. The job of the lungs is to bring in oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. If it can't do that, the body releases a bunch of adrenaline. Yeah. Adrenaline sounds like a good idea, but over time adrenaline can build up as well and lead to things like high blood pressure, and it may even increase the risk of things like heart attack and stroke. That kind of put the fear of God into me and made me think, oh yeah, I really need to get this looked at because there could be health risks beyond just not getting enough sleep. There has been some association with a risk of motor vehicle accidents. In one study, it was as high as a, a seven-fold increased risk of motor vehicle accidents. I think anyone who suspects that their sleeping partner has sleep apnea or their children, they should really seriously uh, urge them to get a sleep study. The person with apnea is at you know, increasing risk of all kinds of, of horrible things, and um, it, it's, it's such an easy thing to fix in a way. Um, why, why should those people be at risk? And if you, if you love your partner, you know, get him or her into a sleep center for a study. So the treatment I would recommend at this point is nasal CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. It's a mask that goes over the nose that uh, pressurizes the airway. Understanding the diet and exercise and the other things we talked about would also be part of the uh, mm -hmm. treatment approach. It's made a huge difference. I'm a new person on CPAP. I'd say, you know, again, I feel like I got myself back. I've always, you know, thought of myself as a cheerful and energetic person and I think a lot of years I was not and now I feel like I am again and what a gift that has been.